Uh, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to an autumn edition of the Bibliophiles. Uh, we are thrilled tonight uh, that Dr. Florence Booz has joined us tonight uh, for the, from the University of Iowa Department of English to discuss Morris at Iowa, the William Morris Archive and the Kelmscott Press. Uh, also joining us this evening, I believe, is uh, Professor Kimberly Mayer of the University of Iowa Center for the Book. Together, Professor Booz and Mayer uh, administer the William Morris Archive as general editor and project manager, respectively. The archive has its, as its goal the creation and accessibility of complete annotated editions of the work of William Morris, a goal Booz and Mayer are well situated to produce, given their scholarly work on Morris's text, artistic output, and book production. We thank them again for speaking with us about the archive and their work on an important part of the landscape of book history at the University of Iowa. Uh, so please join me in welcoming the both of them as they give their talk and thank you again. Great, thank you. I'm first going to speak from a little tiny box at the side of, of my uh, slideshow. And then uh, later after we've had some slides, I will stop sharing. But we've had some technical difficulties in, in um, getting what should be to you. So thank you all for being here. I think that's great. I want to thank the Bibliophiles for inviting me. I want to thank the University of Iowa Special Collections for uh, their many forms of help over the years. I also want to thank the University of Iowa Studio for the technological help that they've given us at various moments. Most of all, I want to thank the people who worked on the archive, who made it a collaborative venture, and who made something so complicated um, able to be um, to come into existence. Kim is unfortunately teaching at this very moment, so I will be speaking about her, but um, we'll be um, talking about the archive William Morris was a 19th century polymath, even though he lived less than 63 years. He did an enormous amount in his lifetime. He was a poet of epics, songs, lyrics, monologues. <clears throat> he was a major translator in several languages, including uh, French, Latin, Greek, but most importantly, he translated almost all of the Icelandic sagas. He was a journalist and the editor of Commonweal, the Socialist League newspaper, and considered the best um, left-wing newspaper of its time. He's known today uh, in many circles as what we now call a fantasy writer, that is, he wrote prose romances. Among these <clears throat> was something that is not uh, just a, a fantasy, but a political utopian narrative, news from nowhere perhaps his most famous work. He was a major preservationist. He helped found or founded the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings in 1877. This is the ancestor of the National Trust and the National Trust for Historic Preservation in the United States, but it has also influenced all sorts of, of other pre preservationist uh, endeavors in Europe and elsewhere. He was a Socialist leader, leader um, the most important member of the Socialist League, which was the democratic uh, branch of the movement of the time. <clears throat> However, many of you will know him as an interior designer, as the proprietor of Morris and Company. Um, he and they produced stained glass, textiles, wallpapers, and tapestries. He was a theorist of art, creative work, and utopian communism. His essays on the democratic meaning of art, how work should be uh, a pleasure to the uh, maker as well as the user, the need for all of our work to be uh, under pleasant circumstances, but in itself of some value. Um, and his approach to utopian, communism, democratic, um, egalitarian socialism is, 
is remarkable. However, in this context, we care about him as a pioneer of, of fine book design. He was not the first, but he was certainly the most influential uh, of his period. And many of the fine arts uh, endeavors of the 20th century are indebted to him. Now, I just wanted to show you a little stained glass. Uh, he also wrote travel narratives of Iceland. Um, here we see the William Morris Archive, as it was founded in 2004, and as it is now becoming to be. Okay, um, such is life. Uh, if you can see me as speaker, I will tell you. I think that the idea for this must have come to my mind when I was a graduate student, and I realized that, that Tennyson and Browning and other Victorian Authors had received very fine edited editions, but Morris, it seems to me, had been left out. He was last edited between 1910 and 15. At that time, there were a whole series of, of new innovations in editing, and I could see that what had happened to Morris was very, very inadequate. When I got my job in Iowa in 1973, they gave us all $2,000 to go and do research. And I immediately went to England and I uh, hastened into the British Library. I was just overwhelmed at the number of manuscripts. I could hardly believe that these things had not been sorted out. There were unpublished poems, there were unpublished pieces of prose. Um, one couldn't tell in some cases whether something was a poem, whether it was a draft, its relationship to other things. And there are so many of these. So I realized that here was a huge task. And with some of the, um, the chutzpah of youth, I thought, oh, this is the task for me. I will try to figure out what he actually wrote. Because in fact, there were hundreds of poems and not all of them were published. So in any case, at this point, I'd like to fast forward to um, 2004 because lots of things happened in the meantime. But by 2004, it was me and we had decided it had to be digital. The University of Iowa helped me and Mark Anderson at the time um, set up a very simple website. I decided to start with the literature, excuse me, with the poetry because it's obvious this was a huge operation and it, it was just too much to do all the different genres. However, um, when I asked my friends, you know, would you like to edit Love is Enough? Would you like to uh, do something with the unpublished tales of the earthly paradise? They came back with things like, oh, you know, I've always wanted to deal with the wood beyond the world. Oh, it's news from nowhere that I like. Oh, I really like this obscure Icelandic translation. So in a way, it had to be brought in to deal with all of literature. Um, now we are expanding slowly into the book arts because as the introduction um, indicated, the project manager, Kim Maher, is a graduate of the Master in Book Arts program who teaches in the program in the English department. And she it is who, who took some of our very fine images and has expanded the book arts section. Um, there are special problems with Moore's. Not only did he write an incredible amount, and as I pointed out, these are not even all sorted out, even now, but um, his manuscripts are distributed throughout North America, uh, England, and Europe. And I can't imagine a good archive that doesn't have every manuscript of an author. I want to explain as the new theories of editing came out, it became necessary to show the different versions of a manuscript. It was no longer considered appropriate just to give you the final, the copy text that the editor had constructed from different versions. Now, Morris's daughter sold some of his writings and they were sold to other people and to other people. And then for various other reasons, uh, they were dispersed. And if you want to understand an author's work, it's very inconvenient if one draft is in the British Library, another is in Cheltenham uh, on the West Coast of England, another one is in Pasadena, at the Huntington, another one is in Amsterdam. So you can see why the 
bringing of these together would be so important and that perhaps it can only be done virtually. Now, it takes a lot of traveling <laughs> to do all this. And at first copyright laws permitted libraries to claim ownership of what was in their possession. So two major things have happened that are really uh, wonderful for us and that make possible what could not have been possible. One of those is a change in copyright laws. So the library can restrict what you reproduce and how it's reproduced, but it cannot uh, claim, it can't charge you $500 to reproduce a page. And the second thing is that digital photography has made it so much easier because it used to be that you had this large camera and you had a tripod, you know, it's really hard to get the right angle where it, or with a digital camera, it's easier to take pictures. So these things have made the archive more possible. Uh, I've continued in the view that I want this to be available to every single person who is willing to access it. This seems in the spirit of Morris. We've turned down offers of um, presenting it in more subsidized form because I want everyone, whether a Chinese high school student or someone who doesn't have access to the academic libraries, which can afford databases to be able to read these works. So um, I'll try to get back to the archive itself. <laughs> now, um, Kim and I have worked for about three years to change the archive from its older form to a new form, Omeka. The theory is that it will have a better database and be more preservable and sustainable in the future. And it can also be read on various devices, which is really important because no one over 40 seems to use a, um, a, a, a desktop computer. Each file, and I think that there are more than 30,000 files, has to have a Dublin Core metadata file associated with it in order to indicate what it is. And so uh, she has had to learn the processes for uploading these, which is very complicated and in which we've been uh, assisted by the studio. Now, um, as you can see, it was a fairly complicated process. Now, I want to explain this page because I hope that somebody who watches this will actually use the archive. There are many ways of getting to material. Uh, let's say you want to see uh, something in a particular genre. If you click on the genre, it will give you all the different editions. However, you might want to look at a manuscript, uh, at a periodical article, at a critical article about uh, one of his works, at the indices themselves, which cross-reference, uh, or advanced search. Now you say, why, why the hell do you need all this complexity, Florence, just give us one thing. But something might be a manuscript, a poem, published in a periodical and published in a book. So you see that we have to come at things from several different directions to try to help. For the advanced search, it works best if you do know what the specific item is, for instance, if you're looking for a particular manuscript. Um, so here, for instance, if you had clicked on poetry, you would see all the different poetry editions. And then you would see my compiled list as I try to make sense of what happened at each period. But these are the big ones. Now, these are stamping tools. They're unique. They come from the Society of Antiquaries. Um, they're lovely things that a friend of mine's husband helped me get. Now, we also have illustrations when we can find them. Morris illustrated his own earthly paradise poem, the story of Cupid and Psyche, even though these illustrations were not published because they were part of a joint project with Burne Jones that never came to fruition. Here we see the Kelmscott Press, um, Wylom, but you can see it's reversed as the woodblock had to be engraved. Um, so the black and white comes out in reverse. Notice this page, which although it's a little blurry, blurry gives you a sense of 
the Kelmscott aesthetic. And it's positioned here because there are three W's. <laughs> so he has uh, balanced it. And this is true of almost every page, I think, as you go through them. Um, you can see what he has tried to do with that particular page. Now, here is a manuscript. You can see his handwriting. He had about four different handwritings. He developed them very carefully. And this, as you can see, is one designed for clarity. Uh, the red letter has slightly faded. It is part of the men of, of weapon for he not only translated these things, he illuminated them. Iowa has bought this for us. This is very nice. Um, it is a first draft for Commonweal. He is writing a, about the horrible conditions uh, suffered by the pit brow women, who are the women who stood at the, the head of mines. And we can see that as he drew his calligraphy, he also put in these lovely little uh, doodles for him. Uh, here he's trying out one of his different handwritings. And I'm pretty sure that this is um, the beginnings of what we're gonna see in the next slide, the Horace Odes. These are stunningly beautiful. They're in the Bodleian and they're teeny tiny. So we're looking at this little tiny page. As you can see, he uses gold, uh, red and blue paint, uh, ink. Obviously it's faded a bit, but the original is not faded. And it is a delicate form of bar relief so that it uh, comes off the page. This is every one of Horace's odes. Each page is different. Each page is a stunning combination of these colors. Now, here's another one uh, in the Society of Antiquaries. This again is, is a text that he has translated. Note that he is starting to move towards what he's gonna do later in the Kilmscott Press. The little leaves and the traceries are moving in towards the text. And this picture would have been by Charles Fairfax Murray. Now, I'm very lucky to have this. I thank Mark Samuels last and my friend who is a book collector who has the only copy in the world of the catalog of the books of William Morris. So we are able to present that. I want to show you how to access a particular edition. So let us say we want to look at Morris's prose work, Notice from Nowhere, we go to prose. Um, we have all of the, we have the introduction, all of, a new introduction, all of the editions in his lifetime. Uh, we have all the manuscripts, fortunately at the Morgan, uh, we've transcribed them. Uh, we also have the variants, and various articles, um, various supplementary materials, teaching materials, ways of going through news from nowhere, pictures, and so forth. So for instance, here we're starting with the Morgan Library manuscript. These are notes by Sidney Cockerell, his secretary, that's telling us what it is. Here's the early draft. It's really exciting to see this. Um, and here we have the version in the Socialist League, its first publication, um, 1890, however, was pirated in Boston. This was very common in the days before unified copyright laws. He didn't like the version that was published in Boston. He added a few chapters and revisions. Here we have the first edition, and now we have the Kelmscott version, which he um, completed shortly thereafter. This is a very, very famous page. He worked hard to 
help the engraver present this framed picture of Kelmscott Manor. Kelmscott Manor is, was dear to him. It was his second home. Uh, and it's also the scene of news from nowhere. And it clinches, it clinches the setting by having this picture. Notice that he has come to use little leaves and flowers. We also have the acanthus leaves and the vines, um, suggestive of, of um, richness and joy. This is the picture of the old house by the Thames to which the people of this story went. Hereafter follows the book itself, which is called News from Nowhere or an Epoch of Rest and is written by William Morris. And we see the birds, uh, we see the, the towers. Um, and of course, we see the balanced capital letters. Now, every single Kelmscott book ended with this caliphon. This, I'm glad to say we have because Iowa bought the proof sheets for Holmes, by the way. Um, it's another for the Briar Rose, which was a poem to accompany a tapestry. So obviously the tapestry would have been filled with roses. So you see that he first put in one of his ordinary or his prior designs. And I forgot to say when we were talking about the initials, he would have done each letter in several different patterns, working on making more and more of them over the years. But each one would have been done in large size, middle sized and small size because they didn't have the um, ability to size. So he didn't like this one. He didn't think it perhaps fitted the rose theme enough. So here he has drawn another one and I think it is a very nice floral design. Now, we have a lot of Kelmscott books. I'm gonna give you the next page. So you see how many Iowa has. Uh, it seems that after the, in the beginning of the 19th century, some librarian bought a whole huge number and or donated them. So we have a wonderful collection and they have also bought a few more for me. I would have to check, but we have, I believe one of the very best collections west of the Mississippi until you, you get to the West Coast, um, many of these. Now, they weren't all in the same typeface. The Combs Got Press designed three typefaces. The Troy was the Gothic, uh, impressive big, big font. The Chaucer was a tiny Troy. You can't see that in these pictures, but it is smaller. And then the Golden is clearer, more readable. The Golden is in what we saw in News from Nowhere. This is the first one that came off the press. The story of the glittering plain or the land of living men. Um, relative to what he did later, it's rather simple and he later republished it in a um, updated form. Note that he's using paragraph breaks instead of leaves. He hasn't invented the leaves yet. Um, now, I wanted to make a point of this one because I have a theory that I haven't uh, heard developed. I think that when Morris went back to what he did in early life, he's going back in the 1890s, he's, um, redoing visually what he had done in words. I think he tries to create a dissonant, uh, disconnected effect. He's moving towards, of course, Art Nouveau or modernism, and he has a slightly different aesthetic. This is one of the first poems that he ever published in his volume, The Defense of Guinevere. It was in Tercet and it would have had a space between each tear set. So here beginneth the defense of Guinevere, but knowing now that they would have her speak, she threw her wet hair backward from her brow, her hand close to her mouth, touching her cheek, as though she had had there a shameful blow, and feeling it shameful to feel aught but shame all through her heart, yet felt her cheek burn it so, she must a little touch it, like one lame she walked away from Galway with her head, now, why would you end the page with head? And look what he's done to Bernard. He has sort of kept the terracets, 
But my point is that it doesn't give you the effect of the original, which is smooth and which makes sense. It forces you to think about the meaning, but also to do so in a a visually disjointed way. And I I don't think that's uh, coincidental. Daniel, nothing that he did was coincidental. Now, here we have one of his very first books, The Recule of the Histories of Troy. He's imitating William Caxton, the first great English printer, and Caxton printed a recule of the histories of Troy and Moore's printed other things that Caxton had done. Now, I want to call your attention to the fact that the inward borders are smaller than the outer borders. The borders balance each other. They're similar. They're not quite identical. This is characteristic. But Morris writes this all down in his theory of how to make a book. You should not think of pages, but of openings. And so if you think of the opening, it makes sense to have the two smaller columns. Another very nice feature um, is that the title is decorated. So we have a decoration and then a little border and then the border. Borders within borders are a big feature of the Kelmscott Press and also of Morris's aesthetic elsewhere. And then of course we have the balance of the white and the black in the lettering. Well, here we have Shakespeare, uh, his lyrics, which were popular at the time. And I think it is another instance of where he keeps breaking the lines, even as the sun with purple colored face had ta'en his last leave of the weeping morn. Rose-cheeked Adonis hide him to the chase, hunting he loved, but love he laughed to scorn. Sick thoughted Venus makes a mane unto him and like a bold face, suitor against to woo him. Notice that he's divided colored and purple. I'm not sure he had to do this. You see, I mean, he could have arranged a little differently. So again, he's trying to create a dissonance as you read what for the reader might have been very familiar words otherwise. This is a wonderful example of it. Maud Tennyson's uh, great monodrama was very popular when Morris was young in the 1850s. Look what he's done with what really are poetic stanzas. He's made them into prose. He's made them blockish. Uh, And of course, he's added the little leaves because he didn't want a lot of white space. So I hate the dreadful hollow behind the little wood. Its lips in the field above are dabbled with blood red heath. The red ribbed ledges drip with a silent horror of blood and echo there whatever is asked her answers death. Now, <laughs> it is a poem, but you see you're reading it uh, as though it were prose and you're forced to think about it. Um, once again, you see these are, are um, juxtaposed, they're confronted, but they're not exactly identical. So this is a wonderful page. This is the title um, page for the life and death of Jason. Notice how carefully the whites are balanced. So we have the bodies of the main main characters in the, the frontispiece with the lovely white eye. And notice how really nicely he's made all the leaves Uh, line up. That can't be coincidence. And then, of course, we have the beautiful acanthus designs. Now, this is a Byrne Jones illustration. He did all of the, almost all, sorry, almost all of the illustrations for the Kilmscott Press books, and he certainly did for the Chaucer and for Morris's uh, own works in many cases. People have debated whether Byrne Jones was the most appropriate Uh, illustrator for Morris's adventurous tales, but they're very fine things in their own way. They're an abstraction, as it were, of the legend. So here we see a slender Jason holding up a teeny weeny ram's fleece, uh, a very delicate Medea playing her lute, and a very sweet dragon 
lying in death. So it has been argued that the flat surfaces and the abstract lack of specific place and time delineations in, more, in Edward Byrne Jones's drawing are intended to uh, create a, a generalized effect. Okay, here we have The Great Earthly Paradise, one of my favorite books. We can see that he has added these little bars, one in black, one in white, and of course, he has placed very carefully all the little leaves. Um, and he has given us a background for the, the title. Forget six counties overhung with smoke. Forget the snorting steam and piston stroke. Forget the spreading of the hideous town. Think rather of the pack horse on the down and dream of London small and white and clean. The clear Thames bordered by its garden screen. Think the below bridge, the green lapping waves might some few keels that bear Levantine staves cut from the ewood on the burnt up hill, and so forth. Um, his lovely invocation of a very different uh, six counties <laughs> uh, than the original London of the Middle Ages. My favorite among his poems is Love is Enough. Uh, Love is Enough is very musical. And when you look at the manuscript, you can see that sometimes it makes no sense in its first version because he's just hearing the sounds, which are intended to be uh, melancholy but comforting. He very seldom used blue, but he did use blue in at least two, two of his books. Music is an actual character in, in what is a, a mask, a, medieval, a medievalized mask. And we can see the use of the border characteristic for um, his shorter lyrics. So music sings, love is enough, have no thought for tomorrow. If ye lie down this even and rest from your pain, ye who paid for your bliss with great sorrow, for as it was once, so it shall be again. Ye shall cry out for death as ye stretch forth in vain, feeble hands to the hands that would help, but they may not. Cry out to deaf ears that would hear if they could. Till again shall the change come and words your lips may not, your hearts make all plain in the best wise they would. And the world she thought waning is glorious and good. Now this one, Iowa bought, um, and it is colored by the Kelmscott Press engraver, who obviously kept a copy for himself and um, colored it. Now, W.H. Hooper, at first, to me, it's sacrilegious to color over anything of the Kelmscott Press. So it took me a while to get used to it, but it is certainly very unique in its history. It's a very small one, too. You can go and see it. Now, as I said, we have the proof sheets of poems, by the way, and here we see Morris has made just one correction on this one. He wants an ampersand to become an and. And if you look at the printed um, version, the 1891 version, you will see that it is indeed and. And I think that that is an improvement. Now we have the wood beyond the world. It's one of his most admired frontispieces. This one is by Byrne Jones. We can see how elaborate and delicate it is. We have the trees, the flowers, the, the little hillocks, um, and then the, the primavera, the maiden who represents spring crowned with flowers. And then we have the confronted borders. So I wanted to end and show you as a final slide this one. As you know, the most famous work of the press was uh, his almost final work, the works of Geoffrey Chaucer newly imprinted. This presents the one of a kind one because obviously there aren't going to be many books that require the capital letter one, one that April with his shores sote, the drought of March hath pierced to the rote and bothered every vein and switched the curve of which fear to engendered is the blur. There are a bunch of puns here. Chaucer, as you know, was a um, tax collector on the wharves of London, but here he is 
in the medieval garden, the um, the um, what is it, the hortus inclusus, and he's hemmed in, um, making a nice box and frame. He's listening to the nightingales, suggestive of poetry. We have beyond this scene of rivers and hills suggesting uh, an area beyond or the infinite. Most important, he's gazing at the well of English undefiled, which was a term used for Chaucer in the 19th century. So it's a set of slight puns. And I notice how many borders, of course, Chaucer himself is bordered, um, the artist poet, but we have this little border, another border, another border, a border around the the wand, uh, the two borders around the pages, the inner border around the title. And then we have all of the balancing white, um, white lettering. Now I have seen this, I forgot to add when I was talking about Iowa, that the Historical Society in Des Moines has the Comstock Chaucer as well as many others. And Grinnell has Sigurd de Volsum. I have turned over every page of the Kelmscott Chaucer in Des Moines. Um, almost no two pages have the same balancing designs. So it's really nice because you see things that are familiar, they come back in slightly different settings. It's not that he doesn't use the same thing, but you can't predict when he's going to use it or how he's going to use it. And I think that that is a characteristic way of explaining his designs. He wants them to be ever varied, not completely symmetrical, but yet in some way familiar. So at this point, I want to stop sharing if I can and just say a couple words. I just wanna make a couple final comments on the archive. I'm really grateful it survived. That's not uh, foregone. I'm always happy when I go to a conference and I sit in the audience and someone I don't know gets up and they give a talk on Morse and they quote the archive as, the, they got it from the archive, it's gotta be right. I'm pleased. I'm pleased that the university library says that we have more hits than any of their other websites. That speaks well for Morse. Um, there are parts of it that should still be completed. I said we're in, in the middle of a, three-year process of moving all those files. Um, but there are also little things in the site that could, could require another addition, another arrangement, uh, another introduction. Um, we could also expand further into the book art and that's something that people would like. I think one has to ask, is this the kind of thing Morris would have liked? Obviously he wasn't an academic, he was, um, a man of many pursuits. And one of the reasons why he left so many things behind was that he was just so busy, he couldn't uh, put them all into final form. I think though that we do try to embody the spirit of Morris because he used very updated technology for his medievalized designs. He was not a Luddite. Um, he used a um, very finest photography and metallurgy of the time. Uh, also, his work was collaborative. In fact, he was especially known for this. He also endeavored to spread the writings and other works that he considered would be beautiful and useful to people. And that is what we do, uh, attempting to bring these to people, um, to everyone who would like them free of cost. So at this point, I hope there'll be questions uh, since, that will make things a lot more interesting and I would I would like to hear your your comments.